Good morning. Welcome back to Daily Devotions here at Springfield Down at the Church. Um, we're continuing to press in and to press on when it comes to seeking God together. So glad to do that with you today. Um, so look forward to these moments that we share together in God's Word and, and for what His Word means uh, for the way that He comes to bring this life and encouragement with us today. I was here early uh, in the sanctuary praying. And, you know, behind me every day when we're in here, you see uh, the same banners I do when I'm sitting here praying. You see that uh, He's alive and you see that He is risen. And I was just reminded today that it is that holy truth that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is alive that makes this day worth living, that makes every moment of life worth living because Jesus Christ is alive. Amen? And he is the risen king, which means that he has all authority and power and victory uh, at his disposal, and he brings that fully in your life and mine and into this world that we live in. And so I speak that today because uh, we're living in a day where there's so much just confusion, there's so much uncertainty, there's so much friction, uh, there's so much um, harm and death that's taking place because of this COVID virus. And it's easy, if we allow it to happen, to get caught up in what seeks to bring us down rather than in the one who was lifted up, who comes to lift us up in his glorious grace and love. Amen. So let's remember today, Jesus is alive. You know, he is the risen king. Uh, and that he is worthy to be praised. And that there is still a mission that you and I are to be about. That is living in and sharing out the good news of Jesus Christ um, through our lives. And so we want to continue to do that through our prayers, um, through our presence with one another at home and with family. Uh, when we're out and about, just you know, be an encourager. You know, be someone who lifts uh, people up. And we're people who believe in faith over fear. So let's be people who press into that in Jesus' name. So glad to be with you today. Would you join me as we pray together? Father, there is still a lot of fear in this world. Fear that's being caused by the COVID virus. Fear just because of other things that are already pre-existing. And Father, for things that now have resulted in lives because of this virus. We just thank you today, Jesus, that our faith in you, our confidence that you are the risen King, the great Son of God, that you are the one worthy of all praise, that, Lord, in our faith in you, this confident surrender and trust of our lives to you, that, Lord, you help us to overcome, Lord, all our fears today, all of our anxiety that we have, Lord, you have given us victory in Jesus' name. Lord, continue to come in power in the way that you bring a cure to this coronavirus, the way that you bring, Father, uh, in a much faster way, Lord, uh, a vaccine to uh, to come about by the way that you bring about, Lord, the spiritual, supernatural healing and intervention in this world, God, and with uh, our nation, Father, with those who are battling against this virus. Lord, we just thank you today, Jesus, for the way that you empower those in the medical and health care fields today, those working in nursing homes, Father, give them strength today. Father, to do what they need to do. Not only the work that needs to be done, but, Father, encouragement to those that they serve when family can't be there right now. But we pray that, Lord, that there would just be a mighty move of your Holy Spirit today in hospital rooms, God, in, in the midst of uh, nursing home centers, Father, where family's not allowed to be in right now. Jesus, that doesn't prohibit you from being there. We know you're there. So, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, let there be a rising up of worship. Let there be a rising up of the presence of peace. Let there be a rising up of this faithfulness of God that we know to be real, that we receive in faith in our worship today. Father, we just thank you for the way that you lead uh, President Trump, Vice President Pence, Lord, our national leaders, our governor, Kemp, our local leaders. God, let this not be about agendas. Let it be about what is right and holy and good. And so, Father, empower what's of your life, Lord, to be imparted in our state, or in our county, our nation, and our world. Lord, we love you. We thank you for today to be in your word. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all, so good to be with you today. We are now in the book of Colossians. If we're 
medical unit, going through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, uh, looking at uh, God's electric power company, as it's called, or not, his platform. And, um, and for Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, all of those books were written by Paul was in prison. So they're called the prison epistles. Uh, the book of Colossians written to a group of Christians living in Colossae, which is modern-day um, Turkey. And, and so I, I love God's Word, and I know you do as well. Let's dig in today. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. says, This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. And I love how that starts off. Paul's like, I've been chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. An apostle is one who's sent out uh, to proclaim and to do the good work of Jesus Christ. Technically, I think all of us are apostles. We are those who as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ, have been made to live life, to be like Jesus. And we are called in mission, every day of life, to go. We are the sent out ones. We are the apostles of Jesus Christ in this world. But I love what he says. He starts off and he says, chosen by the will of God. He's like, I've been handpicked by God to do this work. I want to let you know today that all of us who are living life in Jesus' name, we've been chosen, we've been handpicked to be the sent out ones of God. Every single one of us has been chosen by God to be a part of this family. Jesus died so that everyone could be saved. And when we come to surrender our lives to Jesus, we enter in what Jesus did for us to bring us into his family, to bring us into his everlasting life. And in that place, we've been chosen by God as his children to also be those who are living out in a very intentional way and sharing the good news of Jesus through doing the work of Christ in this world. See, the, the world today doesn't need a people of God who are living sheltered lives. What the world needs today is a people of God who are absolutely in love with Jesus, who are on fire with the Holy Spirit, and can't wait to tell people around us how good God is, how good God is for you and for me, and how good God is, and how He saved us from an old life and now leads us into a new life. Amen? See, the, the world doesn't need us to be sheltered and hiding. The world needs us to be out there abundant, living, vibrant lives for Jesus Christ. We need to be willing to be out there, to be bold in Jesus' name, even when we fall on our face. Because even when we trip, the Word of God is still being proclaimed. Even when it doesn't happen the way we thought it was good, the Word of God, the life of God is still being imparted. And what we'll find is that God knows how to do His holy work. God will never return void or empty on the work that's done in his name. So Paul says he's chosen. I'm reading through First Samuel right now. I was reading today about the moment in which God chose David to become the next king. You know that David was a teenager when it happened. God had hand-selected Saul to be that first king. The people asked for a king. They should have just continued to trust in God. But anyway, that's a different story, right? Saul's the one that pointed, but Saul never fully trusted God the way that God invited him to do so in that relationship. Saul never really uh, surrendered himself fully to this role of being the one chosen by God to lead his people in the way of God's life. And so after Saul several times is not obedient to the will of God, God says, I'm done with Saul. I'm going to raise up someone else who has a heart for me. And that someone else was David as a teenager. And what's so neat here is that when the, the, the prophet Samuel was meant to go to the home of, of Jesse in Bethlehem, uh, David's father, uh, he had all these other brothers who were older than him. And, and when Samuel sees the oldest brother, you know, by the outward appearance, you know, this older brother, Samuel's thinking, surely this guy's the next king. He's got the look of a king. And God says, no, that's not the one I'm picking today. That's not the one that I've chosen to be the next king. It's like people look on the outside, but I'm the one who looks at the heart. And they went through all those different brothers until eventually they're like, yeah, anybody else? And they're like, yeah, we got the youngest one. He's out there taking care of the sheep and the goats in the fields. I'm like, we'll bring him in here. And it's that one, David, that God had chosen. Chosen to become the next king. Chosen to be the one 
that help lead God's people in worship and in life. I want to tell you something today. Every one of us has been chosen by God to be sent out in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We do that by the way that God has made us and created us. And it's important that we do so. It's important that we share that testimony of Jesus Christ. It's important that we're doing the same things that Jesus Christ did. This world needs Jesus. Guess what? We need Jesus, right? Jesus came to our rescue. God. Jesus used somebody chosen by him, maybe many different people actually, to be an influence in our life of God's love. And through that godly influence of people that God had chosen to minister into your life and mine, through all those different people, we came to know the beautiful grace, the everlasting life that comes through the saving power of Jesus Christ in your life and mine. Amen? Come on. And we, as those who are now the chosen people of God, those who are living in this life of God, are those who are called, sent out to do the will of the Lord. I want you to think about it. You're like, yeah, I'm showing up in my house right now. Absolutely, we are. But anybody got a phone? Anybody got the internet? Anybody still have cards? There are ways in which we can still encourage, the way that we can still reach out, the way that we can still bless other people with the good news of Christ. Hey, anybody out there still able to pray? <laughs> Come on, right? Just because we are sheltered, we're not able to get out, we're not able to congregate together the way that we normally do, that does not limit the Spirit of God. And what God is able to do with a people who are hungry and thirsty for all of His righteousness, or people who are humbled together in the presence of God, crying out for the Lord to be known here on earth, in people's lives, and those that God puts on us to intercede and pray on their behalf for. Come on. All right? I want to encourage us to raise up the level of our prayer life. I want to encourage us to raise up the level in which we are called to pray for one another. I want to encourage us to raise up to that next level. Lord, bring your life here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, bring your revival into the people of God so that as we live out a radical life for Jesus, we're going to see the next great awakening of the world coming away to the beautiful, beautiful salvation of Jesus. Amen? Come on. It's time to, to raise up. It's time to ramp up. It's time to go to the next level of God being fully in charge of your life and mine. God being fully the one that we're just listening to we're responding to, we're being obedient to, and we're going to pray. We're going to witness. We're going to live and let the joy of the Lord flow through our lives. Amen. All right. So Paul continues to go here, just again, greeting uh, the Colossian church. I love in verse 6, you know, he's just talking about the way that they, this church, have received the good news of Christ. Look at verse 6. He says, the same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. And it's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. Just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. Listen, the good news about Jesus, the saving power of Jesus Christ, the spirit of Jesus alive in you and me, Jesus changes us. And it should be not just a one-time moment, but the change should be more and more like Jesus is the rest of our life until we go to heaven. That's what we call sanctification or sanctifying grace. It's the divine influence of God to make us more and more like Jesus, filled with this perfect love and life. See, if, if today I'm still kind of in the same spiritual spot that I was a year ago, that I was two years ago, that I was five years ago, then we become stagnant. And really, the truth is, you don't really become stagnant. You kind of just begin to kind of deteriorate, all right? Here's what's needed, all right? Is that the, the, that the presence of Jesus Christ in your life and mine, the work of God, the Holy Spirit in your life and mine, is to make us more and more like Jesus. So the good news about how God saves us is that God rescues us from sin, but He continues to work in your life and my mind to mature us in the full life of Jesus. And he does that by changing us. 
And so the good news that goes out to the world is the very spirit of Jesus Christ who changes us from a people living a spiritual death now living an everlasting life. From a people living for ourselves now living a life dedicated to the Lord. From a people living only kind of secluded and this is my life, my world, to now being God's by you. Use me for your voice. Send me after the greatness of your name. Y'all, how are we allowing Jesus to change us? Not how you're changed. By being in his presence. You know how we're changed? By acting in faith in what he has said we are. And what he has called us to do. You know how we change? By allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to be in full control of our lives. The same good news, Jesus, is all around the world at work. Y'all, Mary, God is at work right now. God is at work right now. He is stirring people's hearts who have been far from Him. He's stirring our hearts who have been praying, God, I want more time with you. But guess what? we got a lot more time with Jesus now, don't we? Right? And we need to be putting ourselves in the presence of the Lord so that he changes us and makes us more like himself. Okay. Let's continue on here. I, I want to go on down to uh, verse number 11. He says, We also pray that you will be strengthened with all of God's glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need so that God strengthens us and being able to do the good life of God and living out a life surrendered to the Lord. We have all the glorious power we need to do that with patience and endurance. That is God, the Holy Spirit, who empowers us to live faithfully for Jesus in this world. And then he goes on and says, May you, may you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. So again, we're people who are part of an inheritance, right? An inheritance is something that is given to us. It's not something we earn. It's something that is designated to us. It's something that's given to us. Right now, we have full access to all the spiritual blessings of God. That is our inheritance. The full life of God in us. And the way that we uh, live in that inheritance is by receiving what God has given to us. And once you receive something, then it's meant to be applied in it. It's meant to be done. For example, if in an inheritance, I received a car, right? Well, if that car is uh, then received and sitting out in my parking lot or in the garage, well, what purpose is it serving, right? It was given for a purpose to be able to be used, right? See, all of the spiritual life that God has for us, that we read about in this Holy Word, that we come to understand through God the Holy Spirit in our lives, is ours right now through Jesus. But it must be acted upon. It must be received and then acted upon. There's no point in getting, again, using the example of a car and inheritance that's just going to sit out there and serve no purpose. But what's been given, it's been given to be used. And I want to tell you something. Faith has been given so that we believe boldly in the greatness of who God is. We believe boldly in what Jesus is able to do to change lives, to change our lives and the lives of other people. And then we go for it in Jesus' name. Right? Strength has been given to us so that we will uh, be patient and we will endure through every trial of life being steadfast and living a life that is fully obedient to the will of God and doing the things that God's called us to do. We have a beautiful spiritual life that is ours to live through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And the only reason that we don't see ourselves changing is that we're not in the presence of God and we're not acting upon what He's freely given to us. All right, verse 13 says, For he, God, has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. I love it, right? That's such a powerful verse. 
He like or he's rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgiveness of sins. We are now people who are living in the kingdom of God. How did that happen? Because Jesus Christ paid the debt on the cross. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through, um, for through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. Let's look at that for a moment. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God, which basically means this. When you see Jesus, you see God. The fullness of God lived in Jesus Christ. Now, he existed before anything else. Jesus is a part of the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he is supreme over all creation. That's an important thing, that Jesus is supreme over all things, which means he's been to be supreme in your life and in mine. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. So basically, everything that's in the spiritual world, the unseen world, everything that's here in the physical world, the seen world, Jesus made all of that. It says that, verse 17, or excuse me, he was, everything was created through him, this is the end of verse 16, everything was created through Jesus and for him. I love that. It's such a, a short statement, right? Everything was created through Jesus, he made all, but those next two words, for him, are so significant. Do you want to know why you were created? Do you want to know why I was created? We were created for Jesus. So often we have the tendency to think we were created for ourselves. We were created to, to do what we want to do, to live the life we want to live, to live in the pleasure we want to pleasure ourselves with, to live in the power we want to have, you know, to live in the pursuit of the life that we want to have. You know, I want to tell you something. We weren't created for ourselves. We were created to know God and to live our lives for God. Come on, right? And it's so important that we understand that we were created for Jesus. We were created to be for Jesus and that to live life in his amazing love and grace. We were created to live life for Jesus and being those sent out to share the good news of Christ. We were created to be those for Jesus who worship and adore him. To be those who um, he allows uh, his spirit to live in and we live to glorify his name. We were created to live life for Jesus. I was created, I wrote this down, I was created by God, created for a relationship with God, created for devotion and service to God. I'm say that again, I was created by God, I was created for a relationship with God, I was created for devotion and service to God. That is our life. That's what we created for. It says verse 17, He existed before anything else he holds all creation together. I love that. And that means that right now, when everything in our world feels like it's falling apart, it's not. And again, it doesn't mean it's not good. We know that there's a lot that's not good that we experience in life. But what we understand is that the world the universe is not crumbling. God still holds it all together through Jesus. It says Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. So Jesus is the one who controls us as the believers of God. He is the beginning of Supreme over all who rise from the dead. There's again that word supreme. That means he's the first. He's superior. He's the one who rules over all. So he is first in everything. And I love this. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And again, when we see Jesus, we see God. God fully alive in Jesus. Verse 20. And through Jesus, God reconciled. Everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. I love that. So, what does it mean to reconcile? It means to take two things or two parties, or maybe multiple things, that will all become fragmented from one another and kind of bring it back together. It's to take things that are unbalanced or out of sorts, right? And to make sure that they're all together on the same page, that they're one. And so, in that place, one of the beautiful words of Jesus Christ is that 
that he came to reconcile everything back to himself. Because of sin, everything is scratched and barred. We all know that. Jesus Christ came to take us who are far from God, who are fractured from life to God because of sin in our life, and he reconciled us back to a relationship with God and make us one in relationship with the Lord. He did that to bring peace into our lives, and that happened through his blood on the cross. Verse 21, this includes you who are once far away from God. You are his enemy, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Y'all, not only did Jesus forgive sin, not only did he bring us back in the right relationship with God, but through Jesus, Jesus makes us holy, the scripture says, and blameless as we stand before God. Now, that has nothing to do with us. That has everything to do with Jesus who was blameless and holy. Amen? But what that does mean is that through the Spirit of Christ who lives in you, who lives in me, we have been and are being made holy and blameless. And that's how we need to view ourselves. That's how we need to allow God to continue to make us whole, right? The way that we allow the, the Lord to change us. God changes us so that we're holy and blameless in His sight. We are able then to live a holy and blameless life, life through Jesus who lives in us. We are empowered by God the Holy Spirit with everything we need to live a godly life, holy and blameless before the Lord. What I love about that is that when God the Father looks at you and me, you know what he sees? He sees Jesus. Jesus who covers us and Jesus who lives in us. And that life of Jesus enables us then to live a holy and blameless life set apart from the Lord. Y'all, so much that's good here today. I'm going to close with this final statement. Go down to verse number 27. It says, For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. I love that. What's for us? The riches and glory of Christ. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. Y'all, here's the secret of life. Here's the secret sauce, the secret recipe, whatever you want to call it, the secret handshake. Christ lives in in you and me. The truth is, is that it's not really a secret, is it? It's meant to be known for everybody, right? So let's let people know that the true thing that they're seeking for, the, truth, the one thing that we're looking for in our lives, is Jesus. And that was the key to living a life that's holy and blameless, that's been reconciled to God, that's been moved from a kingdom of darkness now to the kingdom of God and light. A life that's being constantly transformed by the Lord. What's the key to all that? What's the secret sauce? Christ lives in you. Christ lives in me. Love you. Have a great, great day. Take care.